Hey everyone, and welcome back to Suited Aces Poker, where every week we review hundreds of hands from poker vloggers across YouTube and bring you 10 of the best. Every week we list all of the original content in the description box below. So if there's a poker vlogger that you haven't heard of, if there's a video that you want to watch in full, check out the description box and make sure you click on the links. The poker vloggers all really appreciate it. So what's in store this week? Well, we've got bluff catching, lots of it. We've got loose calls. And at number one this week, a video that you really won't want to miss. There's etiquette in poker, and then there's that. But for now, let's make a start. At number 10 this week, and Andrew Nimi is playing in a 5-5 cash game at the Hustler Casino in California. And there's a loose call from Andrew here, maybe, but will it pay? Same table now, and there's an early position raise of $15. Player in the cutoff makes the call. We look down at Jack-5 of Diamonds in the small blind. Obviously not a uh, uh, super premium here, but for only a 3x raise, again, the small blind is $5. So getting a reasonable price here with a suited hand, I make the call, and the big blind calls as well. Four ways to a flop, which comes down Jack-high. Jack-8 deuce with two spades. I check it, big blind checks, the initial raiser checks, and the cutoff puts out a bet of $30. Obviously not in love with our hand, but can't fold top pair, so I make the call and the other two players get out of the way. Turn is an offsuit six. I check and this time that player checks it back. River's an offsuit three. Could check it and hope to get the showdown here or maybe put out a small blocker bet. I decide with the latter. I decide to make a bet of $25 hoping to maybe squeeze out value from a flop second pair and uh, hopefully not face uh, a raise. But that is in fact what happens. We do face a raise. He raises it up $100 more. Really don't like it when a uh, player adds it for that smooth $100 extra but with my exact holding here trying to uh, trying to work this one out in my head doesn't seem like a rivered two pair is all that likely and it doesn't seem like he should be all that strong having checked back on the turn not having any spades in my hand we unblock we unblock some draws that might have missed here and is sort of forced into uh, trying to find a way to win this pot. Definitely could be uh, maybe a little bit optimistic here, but after putting in the block bet and then facing that raise and trying to find a hand that uh, makes sense, I'm not really finding one. So I shrug, I toss in the $100 extra. Gonna have to complete the story here, show us the goods, and my opponent does not show us the goods. He says, queen high, uh, I could be queen high. Perhaps a loose call there, perhaps a loose bet call on the river, but uh, we take this one down with the weak top pair. Number nine this week, and Brad Owen is playing in a 2-5-10 game at the Lodge in Austin, Texas. And here's a really good example of the benefits of knowing your opponent. While a few guys are still playing poker as if they're taking part in a preparation age commercial, Sashimi has pocket tens in the hijack and raises to 30. Ron loves King Jack offsuit more than Matthew McConaughey hates wearing t-shirts. He calls with it once more. Bradley's trying to fight, or is right, to sit down. He calls with 9-6 suited. McLovin has to make sure that Radley doesn't win the pot, otherwise McLovin will have to pay everyone $50, so he comes along for $25 more. We wake up with an actual hand in the third blind. It's time to punish everyone with ace-king. I take a second to assess the situation and figure out the sizing that we should go with. I make it 200. Sashimi thinks that I'm trying to buy it. I wouldn't mind if everyone folded. You can see that I have the most equity, but it's still only at 28%. Sashimi puts in the 4-bet to 500. She's really only supposed to be 4-betting me a very small percentage of the time. Pocket 10s actually does better as a flat because Sashimi could be crushed or will be flipping a lot of the time. If she called and allowed the other players to call behind her, that isn't that bad since she'd be playing mostly to hit a set and it's often good to have more opponents in the hand when you have a set, particularly when the stand-up game is on and people are playing all kinds of junk that they're incentivized to bluff with. Folds back to me, we know one ace and one king are accounted for, cutting in half the amount of combos of pocket aces and pocket kings Sashimi could have, which are really the only hands that Sashimi should be for betting us with for value in this spot. There are only six combos of those total. Meanwhile, there are nine combos of ace king still available that we could be up against, so I put her mostly on that, perhaps queens, jacks, or some other type of bluff. I call for 300 more, which I might also do with aces as a trap, and then hands like queens and jacks. We're heads up. The flop comes 883 rainbow. We've got nothing and we're up against an overpair. I check. 
The opponent doesn't need to bet too much here. She fires for 400. I could call because I'm getting a good price. I'm not 100% sure what I'm up against, but I've significantly discounted aces and kings since we have removal for those. Several other holdings will have a relatively difficult time calling a check raise when I can still have queens, jacks, and even rockets. Ace king is still a very likely hand that we'll be up against. If I call here, Sashimi could potentially get me off a chop later down the road, but if I raise, show off the full ace highs, including ace king, a good percentage of the time. If she calls a check raise, I can just give up if I don't improve, knowing with a decent amount of certainty that we're beat. One thing that I noticed from Sashimi in previous hands is that she tends to play very aggressively pre-flop and could have a wider 4-bet range than she's theoretically supposed to. With this in mind, I could actually have the best hand fairly often. I don't really like folding or calling and playing out of position in a large pot without a ton of showdown value. The opponent just doubled up and likely won't want to immediately lose a massive pot right after. The graphics for her stack are incorrect, by the way. It says that she has over 8,000 in front of her, but in reality, she has about the same stack as us. She's not going to want to get stacked after she just got those chips. If she has a close decision, I imagine that she may lean more towards taking a less risky line. I'm considering all these factors, then eventually decide I'm going for the home run. I make it 1300. Sashimi isn't happy to see that. It's hard for her to imagine that I'd have called a 4-bet pre-flop, then check-raise flop without something better than 10s. On the flip side, it'd be super sick if she ever shoved here as a bluff since I'll only sometimes have aces and I'll have to fold nearly everything else. There's no shove this time. Sashimi somewhat over-aggressively played her 10s and I applied the aggressiveness right back to induce the fold from the best hand. We get a massive bluff through to break into the green today with some style points. What a play by Brad. Incredible play. Gets through, Strong and the play. Brad Owen fans go wild. Good play, Mr. Owen. Like, a, like a, to a lot of people, that just looks like Sashimi made a bad fold, but Brad literally played that hand perfect, like he had jacks or queens, um, so she could have been dominated pretty easily there. Number eight this week, and Lexo is playing in a big 10, 25, $50 cash game at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood, Florida. And in this hand, we see another perfect river card for Lexo. Or is it? We've also lost every single hand that we've played so far in the first hour and a half, so it's been pretty frustrating. Let's try to change that now with 7 8 of diamonds. I raise it up here to $125 in the cutoff. Button calls, VIP player calls as well. Three ways to jack, 6-6, six, six, one diamond. Checks to me, I check and the button checks back. The turn is one of the best cards in the deck. It's the nine of diamonds, now giving us a straight flush draw. Any five, any 10 will give us a straight, any diamond will give us a flush, and the five of diamonds and the 10 of diamonds will give us a straight flush. The VIP checks again, and now with my straight flush draw, I'm gonna be putting in a semi bluff here. I can get my opponents to fold out better hands like pocket deuces, threes, fours, ace high, king high hands. The button comes along with a call for $175, and the VIP player makes the fold. I think the button's gonna have a lot of flush draws, straight draws, maybe some pocket pairs that are unbelieving. Going to the river, which is the deuce of diamonds, giving us a flush. Finally, we make a hand. So now the question is, should we bet and how much, or should we check? Now the button player is a very solid player. I have a ton of hours with him. I know he's capable of putting in some bluffs when he senses weakness. My thought process at the time is that the button checked back the flop and then just called the turn, so he shouldn't have too strong of a hand here that often. So with my flush, can we really get called by a worse hand if we bet? I'm not sure. Maybe he gets sticky with a nine or maybe pocket sevens. But a lot of the time on the turn, my opponent's gonna have straight draws and flush draws. Those straight draws miss like 8-10, queen-10, and king-queen. So if I check over to him on this river, he may try to turn those hands into a bluff, trying to represent a flush. So what was going through my mind is if I check over to him, maybe it will induce him to bluff with those missed straight draws. It's also possible we could be beat here. He could have called the turn with an ace-high diamond hand, king-high, queen-high, jack-high diamond hand, and all those hands beat us. The board is also paired. It's possible he could have a full house as well. I'm not really sure if I could get called by many worse hands if I bet here, so I decide to check. When I check, my opponent doesn't instantly check behind, so I do think he's gonna be betting this river, and when he eventually throws out $450, I'm just gonna stick with the plan here. No need to re-raise. I think I'm just gonna make the call, so after about five seconds, I flick in the chips, and he shows us pocket jacks for a flopped full house. Our eight high flush is no good. 
at number seven this week, and Mariano is playing at the bike in Bell Gardens, California. He is in a 25-50 cash game, and is this the call of the week against Mariano? Later on, I open 10-9 of hearts in a straddled pot and get called by four players. Yeah, didn't expect that, but here we go. Ace-King-Jack with one heart isn't the best flop for my hand, but what's more important, I think, is that no one should be too strong on this flop. On the other hand, I could certainly have a set or two pair, so with that in mind, I continue with a very optimistic bet of $500. Barry calls on my left, and Masato calls on the button, so three ways to a turn, which is the five of hearts. Relentlessly bluffing multi-way is often a suicide mission, and I know that, but at the same time, who the hell would really be bluffing in this spot? At least, that's what I'm hoping to convey as I continue with another bet, this time 2500 Sure, sometimes I'll run into hands like Ace-Jack or Queen-10, but most of the time, I expect to just get folds from top pair. Barry disagrees with that though, as he calls again, but thankfully Masato does fold. Only two of us left now, as we go to a river that sadly brings no help for me, the Four of Clubs. So now we have a decision to make. Do we give up the pot and surrender with a check? It's definitely an option, and sometimes I do think it's the right approach. But other times, like this one, I think one final bet is the best play. If he has two pair or a straight, I think we would have heard about it by now. I mean, yeah, it's not impossible, but what I think is most likely is we're up against an ace that is just too stubborn to fold on the flop and on the turn. And against one final big bet, I don't think top pair can call. So let's see what happens. Barry Woods is a non-backer downer as Mariano fires almost a pot-sized bet. Barry Woods, brain in the blender. He also semi did this to himself by making the light call on the turn. Call. And a there. call by Barry Woods and picks off the young wow. vlogger. Number six this week, and Ashley Sleeth is playing in a 2 5 cash game at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. And there's a tough decision for Ashley here, but would you fold on the river? Let us know in the comments below. And this one, under the gun one, opens, and I'm in the big blind, so nobody can three bet me, and I peel the beautiful 10-9 of hearts. The flop comes out 10-8 deuce, two diamonds, and a club. I check it over to him, and my opponent bets out $20 into 32. The turn now comes another 10, so finally we're making a good hand. I have trip 10s here with the nine kicker. Two flush draws on the board though, and if he had something like an overpair or some sort of draw, he might be tempted to check back on this turn card. So that's why I bet out $40 led right into him. He thought for a little bit and he finally makes the call. The dealer puts out a jack of hearts on the river, all the flush draws miss, and so now I wanna go for value against an overpair, queens, kings, aces, maybe a hand like jack nine or queen jack that had straight draws that now hit top pair on the river. So I bet out $100 into 152, about two thirds of the pot. My opponent does not call though. He jams all in for $425. Oh, putting me through the ringer. Let me tell you why this isn't just a snap call. If he had queens or aces or jack knight or queen jack, he would just call this river. What is he doing this with for value that I can beat? Absolutely nothing. He does this with better 10x. He does this with pocket eights or pocket deuces. He does this with jack 10, you know, queen 10 plus. So I'm not beating any of his 10x holdings here. He opened from under the gun one, so he doesn't have anything worse than 10 nine here when he opens that early. He also has queen nine of diamonds, queen nine of clubs, seven nine of diamonds, seven nine of clubs. Those types of hands all would play this way and would raise for value. He also has pocket jacks that just called a turn and rivered a boat. But what are his bluffs? That's what I need to know. What is he bluffing with here? Because if I can't figure out any bluffs, then 10-9 is such an easy fold, right? Because I don't beat any value. And I just couldn't really come up with anything. What could he be bluffing with? He would probably use a hand that has a nine in it, which I have. So I'm blocking some of the things that he would be bluffing. If he wanted to take a hand like 
king nine of diamonds or king nine of clubs and turn that into a bluff on the river because he blocks a lot of completed straights. That's possible, but I'm still reaching here. So I really couldn't figure out what bluffs he had. I honestly don't think he would jam river with an overpair. He has to be afraid of the 10 if he has an overpair. So, and with all that being said, I made a pretty disciplined lay down. I was pretty confident at the time. So make the lay down and what do you know? My good old friend, two seats away from me, whips over nine six of diamonds. What? First of all, he's opening it from that early position. Now he's turning it into a bluff, absolutely owns my soul, and just had the nine six of diamonds. So well played, sir. Great bluff. You really, really got me. I just, I didn't give you credit for having that type of bluff. And actually, to be honest, in my defense, later on we learned that that's his favorite hand. I think that I just actually kind of got unlucky that he had nine six of diamonds or nine six of clubs that he was willing to make this play with because he wanted to win with his favorite hand. So that kind of came into play. This was a good combo for him to have, so good on him. But in general, maybe people might start trying to bluff me a little more just to get on the vlog. For sure reason to watch. Look this. at that, look at that. Can you, you want to, that's no, a, no, I don't that's know a if smile I of a bluffer right there. <laughs> he has a 69 <laughs> Number five this week and close to broke is playing in a 5-10 game of the brand new Resorts World Resort in Las Vegas. And when your opponent's action just doesn't make any sense, how quickly do you call? I find myself under the gun plus one. We look down at King Queen of Hearts. We're going to go ahead and raise it up to $30. The cutoff, the small blind and the big blind all make the call. And we're going off to a flood that comes Queen, Five, Deuce, Rainbow. Beautiful board for us here. I'm gonna go ahead and see bet when it's checked to me for $70. A little bit on the larger side, we're looking to target a bunch of middling pairs, eights, nines, tens, jacks, all those random holdings as well as inferior queens. Only the small blind makes a call and we're going off to a turn card that comes a nine of diamonds. This now introduces a backdoor flush draw as well as maybe a couple of his random flows improved to a gut shot straight draw. King Jack, King 10 come to mind. When the opponent checks over to me, I think that checking this back and protecting our range makes a lot of sense here. Again, he's gonna have a ton of random middling pairs, so I'm either way ahead or way behind, it feels like. I make the check back, playing fairly conservative, and we're going off to a river card that is a very innocuous six. Doesn't change anything, the flush does not come in. And when the opponent checks over to me, I feel like at this point he probably has a middling pair or a queen jack or queen 10, and we've got to go for some value. After a little bit of thinking of what to bet, I decide to land on the beautiful number of $240. It is a pretty meaty bet. I cannot say that it's not, but again, I'm just targeting what I believe is a one pair holding that just can't make the fold that I'm beating. I have the second nut kicker and from the small blind to just have a flat here, I'm almost never worried about ace queen. The unthinkable happens though, as you guys can see out of the corner of the camera, I believe the opponent from the small blind decides to raise to $800. Yes, you heard that correct. $800. Over 3xing my river bet here, even though I bet massive on the river, he goes even massive. -er -er. And at this point, I'm going to pause the video and give you guys five seconds. And if you guys need a little more time, pause the video and write down below, what do you think I should do? Should I call this bet? Should I fold to this bet? Am I ridiculous enough to go for thin value and raise for this bet? I'm going to leave that up to you guys. I snap call instantly. Snap, I could not have called any faster. His line makes absolutely no sense. After I call, he immediately says, good call, I have ace high. Beautiful, this, I mean, we're, I think angels are singing in my ears at this point. We have been playing A plus poker, and even when they're bluffing, they're not even making like a ton of sense. Uh, he would later tell me that he had ace four, so he was blocking, I guess, the nut straight, but it's just, it just doesn't make sense. How often is small blind calling with three, four? I don't know, it doesn't feel very often, especially against an early position raise. So I just wasn't buying the story he was selling. And that's how we ended up on this river, winning a massive, massive pot, catching a punt, fair catching it. It's fun to be on the receiving end. Usually I'm doing the punting, but today we're making big folds, we're playing well, and I don't even think we've lost a hand to this point that's any meaningful size. Number four this week, and Kyle Fischel, official poker, still my favorite poker vlogger name, by the way, is playing in a 2-5 cash game at the Orange City Racing and Car Club 
And in this hand, we wonder, could he have found a smaller bet size on the turn to make this one pay? Next hand of note. I'm in early position. I raised to $20 with King Jack of Hearts. To this bet, I get four callers before the big blind raises to $95. It is a decent size three bet. My opponent and me are both very deep and there's a lot of dead money out there. I think King Jack specifically functions horribly as a three bet calling hand. You're gonna be reverse dominated most of the time, but I do have position on the three better and there's so much dead money out there. It's only 75 more to call. I decide to make the call, hoping that a few more people will tag along. Only one additional person decides to call, so we are three ways to a flop of ace, five, four, two hearts. Love to see the hearts out there. Ace high, not the greatest as it connects to the three betters range very heavily. But since it's the Ace of Hearts, it gives me the nut flush draw, so I'm pretty happy with that one. My opponent decides to continue for 135. All right, definitely gonna call that. The other opponent decides to fold. And we see the most beautiful Eight of Hearts ever to hit that turn. It's so delectable and so darn good looking. Oh boy, did that one feel good. On this card, my opponent continues for $225. This hand, I figured he has like a ace, queen, queen of hearts or something like that. For my opponent to continue when the obvious flush draw completes, I feel like he either has a very strong heart blocker or he could even have a hand like pocket aces where he's just not afraid of a flush. Either way, with both of those holdings, I just believe that there's going to be so much action killing cards on the river that I'm never going to get more money in unless I go for it right now. So I'm just gonna jam on this one. You know, my opponent's a three better. He has a very strong range. He's bet twice into a flush board. Hopefully he has something that can call off about an $800 raise. My opponent thinks for a very, very long time, almost a full two minutes. Doesn't know what to do. Doesn't believe I could have a flush because he claims he has a flush. Doesn't think it's even possible. Tries to talk to me. I don't really say anything. And then eventually he folds. So I'm not really sure if he actually had a flush there. If he did, then this was a massive misstep and a massive overplay on my part. I'd rather not talk about this one. However, I don't see how many two heart hands he could three bet. That doesn't include an ace, king, or jack. So not certain I believe him, but definitely disappointed I could not get stacks in with this one. Number three this week, and Rob Rickerman is playing in a 2-5 cash game at Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas. And there's a nice turn here for the best hand, surely. All right, we get started five-handed. First, we have Jack-9 suited in the cutoff. I race to 15. We get calls from the small blind and big blind who calls blind. We go three ways to a flop, four, four, four. Both players check to me. I check back, hoping to improve, and we do right on the turn with a nine of diamonds. Small blind bets out 15. Big blind checks his cards now and makes the call. I'm a little worried, but can't fold now with a full house. It's unlikely either player has an overpair. I call, and we get a seven of hearts on the river. Small blind checks. Big blind takes the lead, betting out 40 now. We're going to have to pay this one off. Let's see what he's got. Is it flat? And for the vlog, got a four. <laughs> First hand, because my man, I just followed him on, nice on YouTube right here. Number two this week, and Poker Beast is playing at the Jamal Casino in Jamal, California. He's in his regular 1 3 cash game, and well, we did not see this coming. The next hand I pick up is Pocket Aces in the low jack, 362 in my stack. There's a straddle on the pot, which is even better. The under the gun player limps and I'm gonna make it 30 folds around the small blind the small blind decides to tag along for 30 interesting worst position at the table it's a pretty big bet he must have something decent and we get back to the under the gun player who makes the call as well going three ways to the flop just shy of a hundred dollars in the pot and the flop comes out queen six jack two hearts connected as connected could be I'm looking to put some money in the pot, protect my hand, charge heavily for draws. I decide on a sizing of $60. The small blind who already is curiously in this pot definitely has something worth playing. Now he's taking the time, rolling his chips across the felt, really thinking about what he should do. Double checks his holdings, make sure he still likes what they are, and goes all in, throws a single chip, and goes all in. And man, it really starts making you question, are these aces still good? What bluffs could he have here that he wants to ship it all in King 10 of hearts? 9 10 of hearts maybe? 
I can't think of anything else. The only value hands that I can see him having here are maybe jacks, pocket sixes, and queen jack. Going back to the question, are my aces still good? That's not a question to ask yet because the under the gun player still has to act 261 in his stack. He has the small blind covered, and he also decides to rip his whole stack in. Ugh, what a tough position for aces on such a juicy wet board. Although I'm facing two all ins, I have pocket aces and I hold the ace of hearts. You never know, would it be better for me to not hold the ace of hearts so I unblock it so they have more combination of flush draws? Probably better to not have it, but also it's really nice to have it just in case those running hearts come in and behind. But I just can't get myself to fold. I just can't get myself to toss this hand away. I know I might be in big, big trouble, but I decide to make the call. And we're going three ways, all in to a turn and a river, hoping to keep it clean. The turn is a five of spades. I like to see that. Put another five on the board, dealer. But no, he puts the king of hearts, the absolute worst card in the deck. And to make matters worse, the middle position instantly shows his cards. The nine of hearts and the ten of diamonds hit the straight on the river. Oh my gosh. What an unlucky, unlucky hand. But it gets even worse because the small blind also had pocket aces. We both had pocket aces. I bet, and the small blind didn't three bet me with his aces. This all could have been avoided. What a brutal beating. And number one this week in a 5 10 game at the Commerce Casino in California, we're back with Close to Broke. And this is a very unusual hand making its way to number one. And it's long, everyone. It's nine minutes. But hang in there, because this is a really interesting example of etiquette at the poker table. There's a lot going on in this following hand, so I'm going to ask you guys to uh, to hang in there with me, because there's just a lot going on. We looked down a king seven offsuit from the small blind after it folds to me. There's a straddle on, and uh, we've got some pretty interesting players to my left. So, look, it's not a great hand, but why not crank it up here? Let's give some action, you know what I mean? I end up raising a $65. Both players make the call behind me. We're going off to a flop that comes king nine five with two hearts and a diamond. I decided to see bid here for $85. We're going to have significantly better hands in our range here, but it's not horrible. I feel like throwing out a bet. We can still get a ton of value from gut shots, straight draws. There's a ton of them out there, as well as some random backdoor holdings and obviously the flush draw and some weak middling pairs. We do get a call from the big blind, and we're going off to a turn card that comes with four of hearts, bringing the four flush draw. I check it over to my opponent. He thinks about it for a moment before deciding to make the check back. We're going off to a river card that comes with three of spades. With the action on me, I think you can go either way as a check call here or a bet and try to target a hand specifically like jack nine, 10, nine suited, those kind of holdings. I feel like going with the ladder is a better idea. There's a great chance that my opponent is just going to snap check back, you know, a weaker holding like I mentioned. So I decide to bet $130 looking to target some of those holdings. And out of the corner of my eye, something really interesting happens. I see my opponent make a forward motion with $130 in his hand. And I see that and I flip my hand over to show it it's good. There's a little bit of miscommunication and misunderstanding. Or the gentleman asked me, you know, what are you doing? Why did you do that? And then it hits me, and I asked the dealer. Oh, did you not call? Did he not call? He doesn't have to do anything yet. He's calling it <laughs> oh, that's awesome. What happened? You know, actually, you know, I was re raise it, you know, but uh, you know, he flopped the card. No. Oh, it's fine. It's great for the vlog. <laughs> great for the vlog. <laughs> hey, he's recording right now. Yeah, it's great for the vlog. So now he's vlogging he's you right now. He's vlogging 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 you right now. Even though he's, he's doing betting, that's the rule. Yeah, cool. I think you should close the card. Because if the floor might come, you got 10 seconds this day. Why are you selling? That's the rule, right? I don't know. Let's let that. The, 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 the floor is going to give you like 10 seconds oh. count. I have, I have, I have no idea. But, you know, I was, uh, he bet it, 
know, I was counting the chips, and uh, he thought, you know, I was calling. I was just calling. It. So I made a bet, and I was looking straight at the board to not give off any tell. And, and out of the obviously the peripheral of my eye, I saw him put out a hundred chip, and then like enough yellow to to cover it, and it was a forward motion yeah, to I, me. And that was the case. I was Again, sure I was listening chips. to my headphones. So and I was a re-raise it. You know, I wanted a re-raise. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this is what it is. He's breaking chips as it is here, right? Yeah. A forward motion is going forward with chips. He's cutting chips across here. Yeah, right here. Facing a bet. Yeah. All right. Dinner's right in the game. And then you just opened it. Did you hear what they call? No, no, he's counting the chip and then he assumed that he, he called. Assumed. Uh -huh. so, to my knowledge, he... sir, there was no two yellow, two white chips in his hand. I just saw the one $100 chip and that's why I exposed it. I would have you obviously not exposed me. my hand, sir, if he had $300 chip. I understand what you're saying, and sure, I am culpable, and I'm okay with that, but I want the, the truth and the honesty to be there. There was not 300 in white chips. I would have clearly noticed that as a raise, or at least an attempt to do so. You had, again, to, to my knowledge, there was this. This is what was going on. I, it just comes, if I saw this, why would I even think of putting my hand over, right? I get it, your rule, I'm happy to go with whatever you say. I just want the honesty and what I saw to be there. If he wants to make a rule, my card is hand is dead, I'm okay with it, I'll live with this, not a big deal. It's a $130 bet. You're but better. I just want the honesty. I just want it to be 100% true you're what the I better. saw. He's facing the bet. You opened up, you exposed your hand when action's not complete. That, yes, sir. Uh, so is in the rules like he has 10 seconds that you gotta give him a countdown to close it? He opens, he's the better, he's the aggressor, he has to call. So, right? So, you get, he opens the card, you get 10 seconds to act. And you're already saw his hand. No, that's why I'm going to be calling you. you, you technically, you listen. You. All right, technically. You, you had to dinner. One question, you never went forward with chips causing no, action. No, no, no. He just opened his heart. No, he called him with chips, and then he assumed that he called, but he didn't call. He never said that, he never went forward. Why is he doing it on this stuff? He's not an angle shooter. I don't know, he's never an angle shooter. I know, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, he's not an angle shooter. You gotta protect your action. Yeah. That's why he's a dinner to say, dinner. You got a bad or a call before you open your hand. All right, let's just do this. If you do you want to raise or do you want to call? I don't give a shit what you do. You can raise. That's fine. Let's just be men. You know my hand. It's fine. Just do what you're going to do. That easy, right? Just do what you were going to do. You know my cards. Just do whatever you want to do. Is that fair? Chop the pot, please. Can you chop the pot? Because, you know, I, wanna, you know, I, I understand. Yeah. I understand. In the genuine honesty in my heart, and I could be wrong. I, okay, again, I was looking at the three. I saw one and enough in yellow to cut out a call, in my humble opinion. I could be wrong. Of course. Of course. Yeah, but you folded and I chopped the pot because I think that's right. You know what I'm saying? I fucked up and I was willing to take the culpability. So I wanted to talk about exactly what just happened. That's why I ran outside quickly. All right, so bear with me. I just wish you guys could have seen it out of the corner of the lens but you can't it's not in wide angle mode what i saw as i was staring at the final card on the board to not give off any tails the opponent cut out a 100 dollars chip and then 30 dollars in yellow and had put him in like in a forward action then he grabbed some extra chips and said he was gonna raise so it's just like goes back to what Matt Berkey and the boys on the Only Friends podcast, if you haven't watched that, it's outstanding. Shout out to Christian Soto. If you guys didn't know, they talked about this recently where it's like, what do you do against a recreational player in that spot? It just all became super, super confusing. Like, okay, if he didn't call, but out of the corner of my eye, I did see that he called. But again, it's my job as a player to protect my hand. And I didn't. Again, this is not like a super frequent thing but it can happen. I've played poker long enough and it, it even happens to me, as you guys saw. As you guys heard, there was some debate and I eventually said, you know what, look, you know my holding is, do whatever it is that you wanna do, I don't care. If you're gonna raise, I might call, I might fold, I don't know, because you could be using this as an angle, you know what I mean? But then he ended up obviously folding, as you guys saw. What I will not refute is that one, it's my job as a player 
and 100% my job to protect my holding. He didn't do anything incorrect. I did the thing that was incorrect. He did 0% wrong. I fucked up. So you gotta own up to it. I did. You could hear it when I was talking. I fucked up. I take full culpability. So that's step one. The other big thing that is of note, our opponent has a very obvious like reroll. Like he knows my exact holding and he knows how to perfectly play against it. Like he said, he was gonna raise or that's what he was planning on doing. But again, I didn't see that. So whatever, take it as you may. Alas, he ends up folding. And what I decided to do was chop the pot. I felt like it was unfair that I did not give him the right to a true river action because I exposed my hand. I think there's a small chance that he was gonna raise, maybe he, whatever. It doesn't matter what the percentage is, I think. What I did do that's unfair is I didn't give him the action to call or raise or fold. Anyways, after the hand's over, he tells me that he folded the worst hand, that he did not have a good hand, and that he was trying to bluff me on the river. I don't know, I feel like super out of it. I played like 14 hours of poker yesterday and now I'm back. Well, Kieran, we here at Suited Aces Poker are with you on this one. It looked very much to us as though that really was a forward motion on your action. So quite what was going on in that situation really does beggar a little bit of belief. I'm glad in the end the hand worked out in your favour, but it does call into question the never-ending stories of etiquette at a poker table and exactly what constitutes action and what doesn't. In this case, the flaws involved, the dealers involved, both players are trying to argue their case, but it all feels to me a little bit as though this can really be avoided if we don't have players like Kieran's opponent trying to angle to win the hand. Controversial for sure. Well, that's it, folks. That's all for another week here at Suited Aces Poker. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do press the like and subscribe buttons. Helps out the channel a whole bunch. We are on course to reach 500 subscribers by the end of June. That's what we're aiming for. So if you haven't yet subscribed, click the button. You won't regret it. Until next week, then. Good luck at the felt.